Hey, what is going on? It's me, Caleb. And I am with my pal, Josh. Josh. He's mic because he's probably going to be talking most of this series. But the purpose of this series is to build a computer. And we're going to talk about everything you need to know to do that, and specifically with the developer in mind. So what stuff are you going to need to run your Visual Studio and compile and all that junk. Sound good? Yep. So he is a computer technician, runs a computer store, and has pretty much been a geek his whole life. Yes. So. I've been tearing apart computers for over 10 years, uh, A-plus certified for whatever it's worth now, <laughs> and I uh, generally love hardware and keep up with it. Pluralsight, it's one of the first learning platforms I used as a software developer. You can get a completely free trial and start learning by following a path on pretty much anything. The learning paths combine numerous courses giving you the step-by-step -step path to reach your goals. Or you can find individual courses on pretty much anything. Maybe you want a class on cryptography, security, Python programming, networking, maybe Java, you name it, and they probably have it. I can genuinely say that Pluralsight helped me advance my skills and my career. I'll leave a referral link in the description. Go check it out. So I know a little bit, but I'm pretty stupid. So he's going to be guiding us through the key parts and how to know what we need. And our, our idea here is to create a budget system. So all this is about 400 bucks, but we're going to say in what situations you might want extra or if this might be too much, how you can save some money, depending on the needs, because everybody's needs are different. Yes. I would consider this to be the best value for the typical, what I would call programmer's needs, but everyone's different, and we obviously have some specializations in the field that are worth mentioning. And like as a general rule, as you spend more money, you get less returns. So 800 bucks is not necessarily going to give you twice the computing power. No. All right, so what are we going to be doing in this series? This episode, we're just going to be introducing the different pieces. Then we're going to be sharing info about the processor. And then we're going to be sharing information about memory and then the motherboard and all the other components. We're going to and then put it inside this box here. And then we'll get into some key things on utilities as well as uh, maybe we'll, we'll have a Windows installation, but also maybe a Linux installation different things you can check to make sure your computer is working right, and how to do some key development stuff with Windows. I'm gonna probably show you guys maybe how to compile in C and C++ and all this different stuff on Windows. So, does that sound good? Yes, yeah, starting from the ground up, just parts right to the software. Oh um, yeah, forgot. He also started a YouTube. So, if you wanna get some more of our pretty faces, check out his channel, link in the description. And we have a video doing a similar thing, but from a more general perspective, not so much development. So if you want to build an office computer, that might be the way you should go. So what we have here is all the parts you would need to build a computer. It doesn't really seem like a lot, does it? Not really. No. You would think like for such a big box, it would just be packed with stuff. Eh, it's mostly air. So this big board here is the motherboard. And we're going to go into detail with what all this junk on here is, but all of these other pieces are going to connect to the motherboard. So yep. this is like the this. example I gave was the mothership of the computer. Mm -hmm. This here, it's a little square. Oh yeah. It's the processor. This goes in the motherboard, the RAM goes in the motherboard, the memory, and the storage goes in the motherboard. So what I want to do is I want to talk about each one of these pieces individually and say what they're for and basically give you the parts list so you can go buy these parts if you wanted, and maybe I'll leave some links in the description for that as well. To start off, we have the processor. Everything runs on this. This is what does math in your computer. This is what a program is compiled with. Uh, if you're ever writing a machine code, you definitely know, you should know what a processor is. Because you're telling this thing, hey, put this memory over here. Um, right here, we have the Ryzen 3 processor. Great for fall 2019, but who's to say where stuff will go, but so what's the, the clock speed and... This is an entry level processor. It's quad core, 3.7 gigahertz. Sounds pretty good to me. Uh, it gets the job done. It really does. So what's, this, what's this run at the time of this video? Uh, I picked this up for $80. This is a sale. Nice. But um, you can expect to pay about $100. Huh. So what can you get for like $300? $300, you can get something that looks literally exactly the same as this. <laughs> But the specs are what you really focus in on this. Um, so while it's made physically, 
to look the same. You can get a Ryzen 7 3800X, eight cores, 16 threads, uh, just a beast of a processor. Now, what would that be necessary for? Is the general developer, the person watching this, going to need to spend 300 plus on a processor? No, I don't believe so. You spend most of your time in like Notepad++ or <laughs> Visual Studio and you know, it's programming is a lot of like mental yeah. angst and Google search, Google searching. It's, it's 90% <laughs> just writing the right thing, not 90% yeah. typing. Yeah, so while doing stuff, it's the same reason I wouldn't recommend an author who writes books to buy the the you know thousand dollar computer. Just get your three hundred dollar laptop and you're good. Yeah. Now there's probably a little bit more demand than an author. <laughs> yeah, but a little bit more demand, and there are, there's also demand like say you work in the video game industry oh, or yeah. you work with um, testing really large database applications locally. Well, yeah. You, yeah, you might want to look into higher. But honestly, core this is what's going to make a huge difference. And this is the storage. So this is solid state. Yes, solid state storage. <laughs> yeah, um, we don't find hard drives anymore in computers unless you're dealing with like media and you need something that's cheap. Yeah. But this works. It is great performance. This is one terabyte picked up for about 100 bucks. Yeah. And honestly, a terabyte is probably a lot. There's a high cost to start development you have to get your id and all that stuff but most of your files are not going to take up that no, much space no they're really tiny i would only recommend uh, to get like a four terabyte drive if you're working in media and you need to transfer big files really quickly but for the average person one terabyte's good you'll never have to worry about it you can even run a few virtual machines and it's it's used to have a lot of space this is the fan it goes on top of the processor and we're going to get into this more when we talk about processors we just want to do a little comparison. This is the, the more expensive processor. Right, so. so we'll hold them up side by side here. You probably can't tell the difference unless you're reading really close. These are exact same, same electrical pins. Um, how they perform is different though. Uh, this is the eight core one I was talking about and 16 threads and, and it comes really with, great. Uh, this contraption, whatever the heck it is. Yes, this is the AMD Wraith Spire cooler. Um, copper and big fan RGB and then over here you got like the you know it's the base stock cooler there's nothing to write home about this well, cool you know we'll go over the the differences and you know why does this look like this and this looks like this but for now we'll move on to power supply that yes yes that scary black box over there you should pick that up Whoa. oh geez <laughs> So when you're connecting all these components, they need a power supply. And I'm not going to say much more than find a good power supply calculator, which is like put in your parts and, you know, you need a power supply with this much wattage. And our general principle is, you know, we're trying to make this budget friendly, but we're trying to make it high value. So don't, yeah. don't cut it cheap on what powers all your junk. Yeah. So this is actually a name brand EVGA. It's a two year warranty which is really high. Most for, of these have warranty. Most of this stuff has yes, warranty. Most of this stuff is, is built so good that they're able yeah. to give these good warranties. Yeah. And even if you don't ever claim your warranty, it's kind of like a validation of, hey, we're willing to, to say our product will last longer than yes. most of the competitor products. When I look for parts, that's what I look at. So find a good power supply that's name brand, um, that reaches your power specifications. And also don't go way above it. There's no reason to buy a thousand watt power supply for our basic yeah, it's build that might use 250 watts at most. Now this, this is RAM, 16 gigabytes. Uh, is that enough? Yeah. Cool. For most people. <laughs> so this, is, this will fill one slot. So if for any reason you needed another one, you could fill the other slot with another one, have 32 gigs. Yes. What the crap is this? That is a DVD drive. Uh, you don't need it. <laughs> I mean, you honestly don't. Um, as 2019 happens and comes to a close, we're gonna see less and less of these. Yeah. They're good to keep around for like compatibility reasons. So I know that I do a lot of media stuff. So I generally like to include these. Yeah. Burn DVDs, people love it, whatever. But optional. But not needed. <laughs> Actually, what we're going to install our operating system with is this. It's a USB 3.0 drive, and it's going to make our life so much better and faster to do it that way than use a traditional disk. 
Cool. So let's go through the cost of each one of these components real quick. And right. also we have the case. We never talked about that, but nothing too special. No. <laughs> Find a good case. Uh, you don't need a high-end case to cool yeah. <laughs> the basic of parts. So this case fits this board. What's the case cost? What's the board cost? All right. Well, let's go over prices of stuff. The case is $30, right. which is amazing. <laughs> this thing? This is about $55 at, at the time. All right, the processor, make sure I pick up the right one. Yes, for this <laughs> build, I picked up the Ryzen 3 3200G. It was a $80 processor, quad core, I found it to be an amazing value. Terabyte M2 drive? 100 bucks, good deal. <laughs> it's NVMe as well. Again, um, it's a high performance drive, it's not cheap. Okay, RAM? RAM was $72. Yeah, that's uh, still up from the Bitcoin mining um, joy. <laughs> this thing? Power supply was $37. This thing? 20 bucks. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Cables? It's all included. All right, cool. And the, the fan came with the processor, right? Yep. All right, so I think we covered everything. Yep. It comes with a total of about 380. Now, if you're watching this, you might be like, where's the, the graphics card? Uh, that's actually in here with yep. the processor. We have embedded graphics, so if you're first time builder, don't think that you need a big graphics card. I was saying when people think they want to build a computer, their first thought is I'm gonna get this boss like thousand dollar. Yeah, everyone talks about, card. everyone's talking about the GTX or the RTX cards and like you have to get this to game and all the games when you start them up, they say powered by NVID NVIDIA. <laughs> but no, um, it has some entry level graphics that are just built into the CPU. They're in here and then they go out the motherboard and it's good. So if you're doing more graphic intense stuff, would you consider investing in a, a graphics card? Absolutely. So maybe, you know, if you're doing some game development or any kind of If you're using like the that. Unreal Engine, if you are making models in AutoCAD, if you are using Blender, all of those programs can you make excellent use of a graphics card. Something that comes to mind is a lot of developers like to have two or three screens. Yeah. I don't know why to get a nice even tan, but um, <laughs> this this $80 processor can support those three screens. Okay. So this okay. build will support three screens. We don't have to yep. do anything extra. Nope, no extra. Nice. Yeah. But I need six. No. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, that's the conclusion of episode one. We talked about all the basic parts. Again, links in the description. I keep <laughs> scooting away from the microphone here. If you have any questions, leave a comment and check out Josh's channel and check out the next episode because we're going to go into depth for these parts. All right, thank you guys for watching. Please be sure to subscribe and we'll see you in the next video. Peace out. Peace. Welcome back, everybody, to episode two. Here we have our guest. Hi, my name's Josh. And we are going to be talking about processors. Mm -hmm. Again, he's the technician. I don't know anything, so enlighten us. Yes. This is a continuation of a series. So we gave an introduction of a bunch of parts of a system and definitely targeted at the uh, home programmer or system programmer. Developer. Uh, well, developer. Yeah, there's the word. <laughs> so um, definitely a system catered to that. And we're going to talk about the processor. We're going to just do a, an installation of this one. Um, we're also going to talk about the differences in them as well. So this is kind of like a budget build, but not junk. Our idea is highest value here. So yes. our entire system was under 400. This processor we're talking about for this build was 80, yep. right? It's quad core, 3.7 gigahertz. Yep. AMD. I have no idea if that's good or bad, but <laughs> it's pretty good, I think. Yes, this is um goes on the AM Force uh, socket. It supports a lot of RAM, a lot of PCI Express lanes. You can find more on their website, you know, finding various spec sheets and stuff. But uh, the Ryzen 3 I fi I've found to be a great value and you get a lot of performance. Um, it's also a really good quality. I, uh, it's not cheap like an Athlon processors that they have, which is kind of like their lower ones. But they also have like a real high-end server Threadripper stuff, which is like throw your money at it. Um, no, this is definitely... So I'm not going to need a Threadripper? No, right. no, those are definitely like... They're way beyond whatever a home user would use. But I need to compile. <laughs> okay, you can, you can be an enthusiast all you want about this, but like I'm just laying so it out. So realistically, this is gonna serve the majority of people's purpose. Absolutely. 
And this is AMD. Can you explain? Because I know a lot of people are going to be like, oh, Intel or nothing, right? Like, yeah, we have Team why? Blue, we have Team Red. So why AMD? Are, are you just all AMD or do you use Intel? And what's the difference? So when I buy a processor, I want to get the most per dollar. And currently, in the fall of 2019, that's where it's at. All right. So it, you so know, there's... That does that change the board you have to get? Absolutely. It changes okay. socket, changes the board. Uh, it Past that, it doesn't change much. You okay. can still use graphics card. You can still use whatever RAM. But the board will change because it's based around that. Um, so there's Team Blue, and there's certain perks like high-end gaming, or they make their Xeon. They've been really famous for the, like, the high-end server processors. But I go with Team Red because they're currently a great value. and. They make great chips and they've just come out with these Ryzen processors within the past 10 years or so and so it's turned out pretty good. So essentially, AMD is gonna give you the most for your money at this level is what you believe. Yes. All right, so I'll buy it whatever, you're the computer person, so okay. <laughs> how do I actually put this in? You just do it. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually. <laughs> so actually, before you ever pick it up, grab it by the edges. See, I don't know this, I was probably just... Yeah, um, grab it preferably by the corners so you're not touching any pins. They put spaces there so you don't bend a pin. If you bend a pin, you potentially might throw $80 away or huh. could be $300 depending on what processor. So look at all these pins. Yes, there is over 900 of them. Wow, imagine there's 9,000. Oh my. <laughs> so first things first, lift up the lever. That's gonna move stuff out. The point of this lever is to lock stuff in and make a good contact. You're good. And there's a little corner there, which yes, coordinates a, with this one. Little corner triangle, and there's like a, um, a gold triangle as well. So you, you can see that there's a little gold corner right there. It's a little bit more pronounced on this one right here. Yep, drag that down, and go. it's pretty simple. So can we turn it on now? No. <laughs> no, definitely don't turn on a computer without the corresponding heat sink, which is this big block of metal with a fan on top and grossness. I need to unscrew these. Yep, those need to come out. So those are for the included, um, like they have a, a bracket thingy that can be put on. So we're gonna remove those. But on their, some of their higher end coolers, we'll see that right there. This little thing that clamps down, clamps this big piece of metal. But for the stock cooler, there's just four screws. And um, while he's taking that off, we can see this. There is a thin layer of paste on there. That is what's called thermal paste. And it allows heat to transfer between that processor and this block of metal to dissipate some heat. And oh, are you doing OK over there? I'm good. <laughs> so that's. You can see it's in somewhat of a circle there, and then over here it's more of a pronounced square, and there's actually a little bit more of it. You can get certain paste, and uh, some people claim that there's a difference, but we just generally don't see much of a difference in the industry anymore. All right, do I take these up? Yes, those come out. So with those up, you can, if you were putting in a stock cooler, you could take off the base back base plate. You see this metal plate comes off. But we're not going to do that. This cooler goes right into that plate. Yep, and it's lined up. Lined up well enough, and from here we'll just screw in stuff. It's good to start from this corner, and then go to this, and then go to this, and then go to that. Similar to what you would do on a car tire. I'm gonna tighten them down like all the way as soon as you do it. No, you gotta loosen this. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. I'm a noob. Yeah, just tighten it a little bit at a time. Your screwdriver's not straight enough. Like... Well, I'm sorry it ain't straight enough for you. Screwdriver's gotta be straight enough for you. It is 2019, hon. All right, so stuff's in there. Pretty tight, pretty secure. And now you wanna connect your fans. What? Your fan. Huh? Fan. What do I do with it? Put it in the fan header. Right here. The thing labeled CPU fan. 
da, 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 da. Some of these AMD ones, they use these brackets, but this one doesn't. You can kind of keep those if you're ever thinking about upgrading later. So we can throw these out? Essentially, yes. All right, so that should do the trick. I don't think we'll need much more than that. Uh, we were talking earlier how as you increase the cores, you're not necessarily getting that same amount of in increased performance, right? A program has to be able to support that number of cores. Yep. And there's a cost to parallelization. <laughs> yes. So what are some of the issues you can have with the processor and what ones are fixable and when, when do you know you need to get a new processor? All right, excellent question. Um, a very common problem with uh, putting in a processor and generally physically touching them is these pins. Um, there's like 900 of them and each of them are very, very small. And you can actually bend these and if you try to bend them back, they could break off. And it, if you bend one, it could potentially just break the whole thing. I see. Um, so everything is very connected. Some are power, some are memory, some are IO, and you have to have all of them. What about overheating and stuff like that? Is that gonna happen? Overheating? Every modern processor has what's called like a thermal shutoff point. And this applies when you're overclocking, which means just raising the speed, making it faster. They can shut off. When that happens, it's not gonna cause any permanent damage. It causes permanent damage when you overclock and stuff stays hot for very long periods of time past what's called the thermal junction. Ah. Thermal junction is like the manufacturer's cutoff temperature, temperature. It's a hot word. Yeah. And those will generally range between 160 degrees Fahrenheit to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow, dude, you could cook food on <laughs> Yes, they're, they're very hot. They, it, within such a very tiny space as well, we have a very thin um, heat spreader on this, but that, net, that will um, spread Dispare. out. Yeah, it'll spread out into a bigger cooler like this. This is called the Wraith Spire, and it's really good. It comes with all the Ryzen 7 processors. This is good stuff. So what, what it does is it heats up this copper block, heats up some water in here, and just spreads stuff out. Similar to how your car does, or an air conditioning unit, it runs it through radiators and fans. Yeah. And, um, this is a system that's needed to cool a little processor. Cool. Next up, we're gonna be talking about RAM and storage. So you don't wanna miss that. Uh, watch me embarrass myself trying to put together a computer. So check it out, and thank you guys. Be sure to subscribe and check out Josh's channel. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to episode three of our Building a Computer Budget Developer Machine. Coming in around $400. This is my boy, Josh. Hi. We're going to be talking about RAM and storage. Yes. And these could both be grouped as... Volatile and non-volatile types of memory. So basically you need to store information, give your computer a way to memorize stuff essentially. Yep. So explain volatile and unvolatile, or was it non-volatile? Yeah, you're onto it. Okay. So <laughs> volatile is, is generally what your computer uses while it's on. It can be the operating system loaded up, it can be a program loaded up, it can be a graphic video loaded up, and um, anything that's generally ready to work with within seconds is our volatile memory. So RAM is volatile memory. This is where, where you create variables. This is where they go. When you get a stack overflow exception, that's because part of this is the stack. All that junk comes from the RAM. Yes. This part is the non-volatile memory. It doesn't go away. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is where you store stuff on your computer. This is your hard drive, essentially. We're working with an M2 drive. It's one terabyte and costs about a hundred bucks. Which is great. We live in an amazing time. <laughs> Five years from now, you'll probably be like, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> but this is where all the data is saved and stored on a series of chips. And um, you know, when, when you turn on your computer, your computer looks for a file in the non volatile memory and that's just kind of where everything starts. Yeah. So generally, this is the the slowest part of the computer. Yes, it is. The the M2 helps. This is you said it was gigabit speeds, right? Yes, this is um, an NVMe drive, which goes over the PCI Express. Uh, if you don't know what any of that means, just know that it's a lot faster than SATA. So yeah, if you're using a piece of crap 
crappy spinning hard drive, do us all a favor and throw in the trash. Yes, I would say spinning hard drives now are a bottleneck in a lot of systems. I still I see Verizon 3 systems with a hard drive and it doesn't make sense because everything is slowed down by the, the fetching of data. Yeah. All right, so here we have some other kinds of drives. This is the kind to throw away. I mean, it's super cool. This this isn't what they actually look like. They have a cover. Yeah, they have um, a cover, but this is disassembled to show you that this is a spinning hard drive. Yeah. So they literally spin, and we have numerous of the, what are those things called? Uh, actuators, motors, <laughs> servos, whatever you want to, uh, yeah. there's a lot going on to create a system that's going to write data magnetically onto this metal disc. Yeah. And the data is split across, there's numerous discs in here, there's three. Yes, yeah, the discs are sided. Yeah, um, they're called platters, and um, yep, they're stored on that. Yeah, so that is that. It's, it's really slow, they've been around since the 80s, <laughs> and uh, they had a great long time, and even so now you'll find the cheapest cost per gigabyte in the hard drive, so they're yeah. not completely bad, but they are being phased out yeah. slowly. And for, for a development machine, we're not really looking to store terabytes and terabytes of information, right? No. We're, we're not going to need more than a terabyte, so this isn't going to serve our purpose, especially for I.O. applications reading from databases or whatever. Yeah. This is going to be a serious bottleneck. Yeah. If you're working at a company, they're most likely going to hire someone who knows hardware well enough. So maybe you're going to buy a high performance cluster or something. Yeah. Um, but that's going to be external to your laptop or machine. So. Yeah. This isn't programming at that point. You're, you're basically setting up the um, uh, server environments for big, deployable, scalable applications. Yeah. Or just use like AWS and not have to worry about it. Yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so next up. This. This is also a solid state drive. So that's on the level of this. Yes. Just different. But as you can see, there's a little bit of difference. Um, this is like a whole generation faster. Uh, like I said, this is over the PCI Express. So this will get like 300 Plus. megabits per second? Uh, yes. So you said? Yep. Uh, it's uh, 300, 600 megabits per second. Basically, you kind of capped it there. They're not going any faster. So these are in gigabit speeds as far as transferring and moving files back and forth. These are not so much. While, you know, you can make a series of chips, but if it's limited by this, what's called the SATA bus, then you won't get the performance that you want. Yeah. So SATA is the, the type of connection, right? So yeah. when you connect this to a hard drive spot, you're uh -huh. using a SATA cable. Yep. Um, so there's cables involved and there's generally clunkier limitations. Although these are, these are generally used for um, if you want to upgrade your laptop. Yeah, I mean, I see these all the time. If you have something from like five years ago before these drives were ever even made, you're probably looking at one of these. Yeah. And they're good. My uh, old work desktop, I replaced one of these with a, a solid state just like this. Mm -hmm. And it like quadrupled the speed <laughs> Made of everything the better, yeah. <laughs> so that's a bit on storage. There's other stuff, you know, there's removable storage like SD cards and there is external drives yeah and there's cloud storage like built-in storage on an iphone but none of that's really super applicable to what we're doing right now yeah um, if you're going for a, a new system build in the fall of 2019 get something like this so how much space should someone need for in our context we're talking about developers yep. so there might be a, a, a pretty decent upfront cost of storage to get your IDEs and any tools you need to develop, but the actual files themselves don't take up a lot of space. No, not a lot. So my thoughts personally, 256 minimum, because that's just for comfort level. Yes. I think one, 128 is gonna limit pretty much everybody. Mm -hmm. 256 you can work with, I think 512 is ideal if you can afford it. One terabyte, it's nice to have. I think it's great. No. There is some, some stuff to consider because not all programmer developer is the same. Um, you could be working with IDEs. You could be working with um, hypervisor, which is like a virtualization of operating systems, mm, yes. basically running multiple at once. Yeah, in that situation, that's gonna take up a lot of space. Yes, that does take up a lot of space because you're not just installing Windows, you're allocating like 250 gigabytes for a virtual computer. Yeah. So something to I guess take also in like if you're if you're developing, you know, applications for phones, you might get 
lots of different phone versions downloaded to mm-hmm. emulate and that might take up a lot of space for each one of those. Yeah. Is that what you just said or something else? <laughs> yeah. Well, not just phones, but also you could be emulating the Mac workspace, a Linux workspace. You could have your computer in multiple different operating systems and say you want to run your Minecraft server and then you also <laughs> want a Windows server. Been there, done that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I don't know if we answered the question. How much do you need? All right. So we <laughs> talked a lot about speed. We didn't talk about capacity. I mean, in my professional opinion, <laughs> I would recommend the 480 gigabyte. Like, 480? Yes. So minimum 480. Yeah. Any extra is if you think you want extra, go for it. It's not crazy expensive, yeah. but... I do a lot of um, what I would consider home office builds, uh, generally serving residential general purpose computing, yeah. and 480 has been more than enough for so yeah. many people. I personally, I have two MacBook Pros. One's 256, one's 512 and that has served my purpose fine. They do run out of space on, on occasion, but I'm doing a lot of media work, editing videos, and so forth. Do you have a YouTube channel? Yeah, believe it or not. So what I did was actually, I signed up for a business account for, for Google Drive, and I got a terabyte on there. It's like 10 bucks a month. And if you're producing terabytes and terabytes, if you're running a small business or a small software shop, and you need a lot of space, you can get unlimited cloud storage through them if you have five users. So it ends up being like 50, 60 bucks a month for in theory unlimited. Definitely recommended in the production environment. When you go with services like Google or Amazon, you get redundancy. They're not gonna lose your data. Yeah. Um, when you're building your, your home builds, um, there are certain things to take into consideration. Um, if this part breaks, well, you do lose all of your data. So there's definitely some value in these services for um, people like us. So here we have an M.2 slot, has a bunch of different sizes. This one's an 80 millimeter, and it puts down, and then with one finger on it, and then the other one you're positioning the screw in. Pretty self-explanatory, but it can be kind of awkward to be honest. <laughs> All right, and it's in. All right, there's not much to it. Um, I love these M.2 drives. There's no wires, there's no power connectors. It's pretty good. Then I just take this and just ram it in there, right? Yeah, ram's a little bit different. Um, start from one end. So these line up with that thing. So yes, ram, this way. ram is keyed. So we can see the, the notch right in the center. Push in one end. Oh, I hate this. Push in one end first and you hear a click and then push in the other. Have a small heart attack and it works. Oh. So, next thing. Can you explain the type of RAM? DDR3, DDR4, what's all this junk? Yes. DDR4 is a standard. It's made by a company called JDEC and it tells the computer, this is how we're gonna to talk to RAM. And we're not just gonna make any modules, we're gonna make modules that reach a specification. So this one runs at about 2400 megahertz and that's the speed it's talking to the processor and exchanging data. So is DDR4 better than DDR3? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. Funny you mentioned that. Yes, as about every few years we get a new generation of memory and it creates um, you know, higher memory densities. That's why we went from having 256 megabytes on a stick to 16 gigabytes right here. So what about uh, DDR5? DDR5 is actually, they've made the standards and it's coming out next year. Which is crazy exciting. I can't wait for the summer of 2020. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I don't really realize the excitement because I don't do this every day, but. No, it revolutionizes <laughs> everything, um, even with. So like, it's like double density or something? Mm-hmm. Uh, double data rate, DDR. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that's pretty much it with RAM, memory, and uh, yeah, any final words? Any final words? Don't buy cheap storage because you put all of your files on it. Oh yeah, you run a computer shop. Yeah. And that's how you make all your business. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sadly it is. Um, and there are companies that will charge thousands of dollars to get your data back. What I chose here was a crucial P1, it has five year warranty on it, which is one of the best you can get right now. Um, there have been, you know, you can get like a knockoff brand, which is like this Zynho right here, and only has three years warranty. 
You can even go further down and get a Western Digital Blue. And uh, why some, we can get some from Wish? Yeah. <laughs> No. <laughs> the cheaper storage gets per gigabyte, you usually run into just a lower quality product. Yeah. It's worth putting in more money because if you're working in a production environment, the way you look at this stuff is going to be different. If you lose it, it costs you way more money than it costs to replace it. Yeah, so it's in a way, it's kind of an insurance. Like you're paying the extra for the ease of mind of not losing your data. Yes. Okay. Take it from him. He fixes this stuff every day. So <laughs> yes, I see lots of broken, broken stuff in here. On the bright side, these things move, which means they can break easier, right? Yes. They create heat. There's a little friction. They spin at 7,200 RPM. They're only good for like nine years or so. And then we, we see them start to break down. Do the, the solid states have a a degrading principle, I've heard of that. Like over time, like they become less working. <laughs> when they were when they first came out, it was really bad, but now con normal consumer doesn't have to worry about it. Okay. Um, especially in like the home general purpose build that we're making here. So maybe like Google has to worry about it, but Yes, Google uh, Google probably doesn't want to put everything on solid state drives yet. But eventually it'll get there. Cool. Well, thank you. Uh, check out the next episode because we're going to be talking about the motherboard as well as some other random components. So all that other leftover junk that needs to go on here. Yeah. And we're going to put it together after yeah. that. So. What we've talked about is the core system. Everything exists. Everything that's important exists here. But there's also other stuff like a power supply and a DVD drive and a case. <laughs> and this is less, you know, thing, less attractive things to talk about. But they're still important. Yes. All right, thank you guys and subscribe. Yep, definitely subscribe. Welcome back everybody. In this episode, we're gonna be talking about everything else that we haven't talked about in the last three episodes. So we've talked about RAM, storage, the processor. Now we're gonna be talking about the motherboard, the power supply, the case, any leftover stuff, some IO stuff, and just wrap everything up because in the next episode, we're gonna be putting this in the case and getting everything pieced together, so. Yep. This is the last informational boring video, so after this you don't have to stare at our talking faces anymore. Yep. My name is Josh and Caleb oh, in yeah. invited me to help him with, <laughs> with some of this stuff. Yes. Hi, nice to meet you. Go so, sub to his channel. Yep. So what we're gonna talk about is the motherboard and how it relates to the case and how it relates to a power supply. And basically just the general mishmash of connecting all the components and making sure everything's compatible. I know it sounds like it'd be easy just buy any old power supply, but no, it's actually a little bit different. This one is actually called a micro ATX case. That means someone has measured that it goes this way and this way. Case? Yeah, my, this one is a micro ATX motherboard. Ah, so you would get a micro ATX case to fit this one? Yes. Okay. That means they've measured like this way and this way and it fits like certain dimensions or screw holes in certain places. So don't be intimidated by the wide selection of other boards. So we have another one over here. What's going on? Why do we have two? Yes, this one is a bigger one. It supports some, some different standards like PCIe Gen 4. It supports more RAM slots. Think features. Okay. So is this overkill for the general developer? Yes. Right. I think this is overkill actually for most people. Okay. But some people want really that. want a nice computer yeah. to last them for years. And that's fine. You know, you have money, you want to you want to buy something nice. <laughs> so I actually have a client getting this 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 motherboard and this, you know, set of RAM and CPU because he wants a really nice gaming desktop. And we've moved up to the Ryzen 7. We have 16 gigs of RAM and everything's going to fit nicely on this. Nice. We also have a a bigger case to put it in and we needed the the uh, bigger board so we're just kind of leaving this here for some comparisons just so you guys can see mm -hmm. so what size uh, is this this is called the atx okay and this is the micro atx what el what other kind of sizes and stuff are there there is extended atx a big one we're running into recently is called the mini itx that's the, the small form factor ones mm -hmm. think tiny micro pc you, you Screw on the back of your monitor. Oh, cool. All right, so the motherboard, what the crap does it even do, honestly? It connects everything. So 
The motherboard doesn't really make anything faster. You know, buying the gold-plated motherboard isn't gonna create the returns that you know you desire in a fast computer. The motherboard, think of it more as like features, compatibility, connectability, and it supports all the other things. Mm -hmm. So if you had a better processor or better graphics card, you might need a different motherboard to support that. No, no, I can put. Uh, so this is kind of like the cheapest of the cheapest motherboards right now. I can put the best graphics card that AMD has. So like the mm -hmm. Ryzen 7 3800X in here. It's and everything, fine. everything will be fine. So what's the incentive then, if it doesn't do anything different, to go from one like this to one like this or something better? The incentive is when you want it to do something different. So like there are certain things that you can do with a better motherboard. Overclocking is one, uh, which I'm not gonna recommend for most people, but if you're into overclocking and want to squeeze the best performance out of your unlocked AMD or Intel chip, then getting a better motherboard is the way to go. And that, that's most noted by these big heat spreaders right here. So they control the voltage to the CPU, they have dissipate some heat. And you're talking a whole different language. If you want to do like adding more RAM, get something with more slots. If you want two graphics cards, you have to have hmm. slots for that. Okay. So think of your end goal in mind and you'll usually find the motherboard that's right for you. Right. So does this support a graphics card? Yes, both of these can support so that would any be graphics right, right card. Here, right? Yes, this is the PCI Express 16 But slot. this one has two. Yes. So I can put two graphics cards. Uh, yes. Do I need to get two graphics? No, you don't. Why not? What if I, <laughs> I want to play Fortnite? So this goes back to if you need something different or if you want something different or if you want like the best AMD you know, two graphics card thing, you can do that. So the embedded graphics, uh, which is the graphics that are on the processor in this, they don't do much. They can support three displays with like notepads or whatever, whatever programmers do, <laughs> but they're not gonna create um, excellent video editing experiences. They're not gonna create, um, say you work in Unreal Development Kit and working with 3D models, that's not gonna be very smooth. And I would recommend a graphics card at that point. If you're working with anything in media, you, there's a need for now, it. Now, totally also off topic. What about like cryptocurrency mining? Should you use something like this or should you get like a, a dedicated device for something like that? Do you, do you know anything about that? It depends on your budget. <laughs> okay. So if you, if you just want to have a computer that's good for it, sure. Um, it doesn't make much of a difference. Have a good graphics card and mine away. But if you want to set up a big server farm or whatnot, there are, there are actually specialized boards out there that support maybe um, there might be like 10 PCIe slots to support 10 graphics cards and it's a good time. <laughs> now, when it comes to the motherboard, getting a crappy one, is that gonna put your other components at risk? Like if I get the cheapest motherboard, can it fry my other graphics card or my... Processor. Yes, it can. Uh, getting a motherboard from, let's say, five years ago because you're trying to cheap out um, old circuits as well as, um, you don't see this as much now, but if you get something that's off-brand, you'll find less warranty options and less general quality of service. Not recommended. Go Stick with the big names of MSI, Gigabyte, um, <laughs> There's a lot of them out there. Okay. <laughs> all right, so let's talk a little bit about all this junk. What's going on here? This is the I.O., right? So. Yep, the input and output. What's what's important here? I can put three three screens on this, right? Yep. That's what really matters. Yeah. But we got USB. That's uh these two right here. And then we have the, the blue coated ones. This is a US, USB 3. Is there any other important stuff here? Is that pretty much it? Nope, you're gonna find a general assortment on any motherboard, which will come down to Old I.O., like a PS2, keyboard and mouse, um, your displays, your USB, your network, and then your audio. So no USB-C? No. That's generally not a standard. Okay. But we're starting to see it. Okay. Uh, so you just could use an adapter or something if you needed to do mm -hmm. that? Yes. You can adapt stuff and buy stuff. This one actually has a C. You can uh. see right there. <laughs> <laughs> and... It's right there, and it's nice. <laughs> what right. else do you want to say no, about No, that's good. You'll see more and more of these as we go on, and stuff gets smaller, and we want smaller ports, and there's a demand for it. 
we've covered the power supply in earlier videos, but essentially get one that's going to meet the needs of all your components. You mentioned a calculator. Yes. So for a power supply, go online, go find, look up online power supply calculator, and you'll be led to a site where you can just put in all of your components and it'll say, hey, your system at load is going to use like 250 watts, get something that's like 400 watts or something. It, it'll let you know, uh, don't cheap out on the power supply. Power supply is also related to your motherboard in that you need to make sure you have the right power connections. How do you know? How do you know? Well, you can look up specs for everything. Okay. Um, the big ones to take uh, consideration are of the motherboard power. There's also the CPU power, which is like a, a four pin or eight pin. Um, so they still make like cheaper power supplies with four pins that might not be compatible with your newer eight pin processors. There's, there's stuff to consider and make, just make sure everything can connect to each other and you have room for expansion if you want to. So this is an ATX power supply. This is a micro ATX board. They're still good. They still go in the same case. Um, if you're working with other ones, just make sure that like the form factors and the shape of stuff matters. That's a big thing to put on power supplies. And the last thing over there, we got the uh, DVD drive. Yeah, we don't talk about that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so that's going to go right here. Mm -hmm. And this cable here is going to plug into somewhere. This is the SATA cable that goes between the DVD drive and the motherboard. So that goes right here. Right here. Yep. Okay. So is there any other main components that we should talk about that people need to know about? Like what's maybe some of the, the, the BIOS or the battery? or? Yes, yeah, so there is some stuff to mention. And while it might not affect your system build, it should you know you should know about it there's there's always like a black corner like a corner chip right here it's sometimes it's big sometimes it's not it's called the chipset this is what orchestrates everything talking to each other um, not everything's on the same time clock and it does that job over here we have the chipset on this with the new pci gen 4 we're starting to see fans come back onto the motherboard there is a clock and there's a BIOS chip that keeps track of time when you turn your computer off. If you're overclocking, it saves the settings. What we'll do now is we're going to take all these components, we're going to put them in this thing right here. It's $30 box. This is the case. This is a micro ATX case. $30 by Rosewill. I love it. <laughs> you don't need to buy a $100 case unless you want RGB lighting. That's wait, wait, we're not getting RGB lighting? No. I'm done. Forget. Done. All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the moment you've been waiting for, where we're going to take all this junk and put it in this thing. Very technical terms here. Yeah. <laughs> in the previous episodes, we've talked about every single component of importance here and how to know what to get, what the cost, and so forth, generally approaching the developer. Obviously, this computer is much more general purpose. You can use it for a lot of things, but that's my audience, so that's what we've been focusing on. Yeah. This is Josh, he's a technician. He does computer repair, builds computers, and this is the, the PC he recommended. Yes, this is. What we're gonna do now is just put stuff together in the case, and I'm gonna go over like some best practices, step by step, and not leave anything to just chance on this. Yeah, and as mentioned in the previous video, this is ATX micro case? Yes, this is a micro <laughs> ATX case. Micro ATX board when it comes to sizing. So boss, what is step one? We take off the lid and put in the risers. All so right, let's cool. clear stuff out of here and... Now if you don't have, to this point, the only thing we did was we put the processor on, the, the RAM, and the M2 drive. So that's the only three steps we took. Wow, could you got any cheaper case? I'm just playing. Actually, no, I couldn't have. This was $30 and I love it. It came with a fan. It actually came with two. It has one up front and then it has one in the in the back there. I took this one out. I wanted to use it for another project. But there's no room for LED lights. No, this is not the intended purpose. <laughs> so this is for like the on button and junk, right? Yep, USB, audio, so it's and then all the, put all that the switches. 
So the first step is not putting in the motherboard. <laughs> it's actually putting in the risers. So grab that little bag of screws and uh, pick so out all the little brass ones and we'll put them in there. Explain yourself. The risers are what separate the motherboard from the case. So there has to be a little gap because it's metal and stuff conducts and these need to be there. So what, where you're gonna <laughs> put them is, um, if you look at the board, there's, there's spots Big laid circles. out and um, yeah. Gonna put them in there. It's harder than it looks. No, it's not. So after we got the risers in, we're gonna put in the rear I/O shield. This protects stuff from shorting out and connecting where it shouldn't. Okay. Put it out and then push in. Does it feel like it's in there? Yep. Yep. That is. That is in there. Cool. All right, now that we have the IO shield, we're gonna take the motherboard and actually put it in there. This we're thing? Gonna be, yeah, we're gonna be very careful <laughs> not to jam it or rub it up against metal. Try other way, like, like so. <laughs> this is like the operation game. Yes, it is. Oh, I touched crap. It's not quite like operation, but you want to treat it like that. And you got to understand that if this board is scratched in the wrong way, you can't repair it and you just have to throw it away. All right, what do I do now? Right now, you're going to find some screws that are going to, um, you can screw in the motherboard with. These screws go on the spacers. Yes, the they, go, they go on the spacers. All right, we got two types of screws. We're using these ones for the, the risers. What's this for? And that's for the DVD drives or hard drives. Cool. Other stuff. Mm -hmm. There we go. Everything is screwed in. And then this. Yep. Rear fan connector. Goes somewhere. Just do it. You gotta guide me more, dude. I don't okay. know what I'm doing. All right. Rear fan connector goes right here. Um, right. It's labeled SysFan. But there's four, and there's only three on this. That's side. okay. Which three does it go on? Where it fits. Okay. The most unhelpful answer. There we go. All right, next is put in your power supply and the DVD drive. Make sure you're getting that. Uh, what do you want to do first? Let's go DVD drive. Sounds easy. All right. For this case, you want to put it in from the front. Um, it's got to be flush with the front panel, so stop right there. Beautiful. All right. And that's what those bigger screws are going to be for. All right. When's the last time you used a DVD drive? <sighs> can't remember. You can't remember? No, nope. my 2015 MacBook didn't even have one. That was like five years ago. Put it in there, right? No, no, no. This is another. This is another version of operation. Don't touch this. anything with all the things. Oh. Okay. Nope. Rotate it again. Rotate it this way. No. Back this fan. Way. This. Yeah. Way. Yeah. There you go. Fan faces all the other junk. All right. So you see this notch? You're gonna want to get this panel around that notch. There. Yeah. What? Yeah, that's generally what I say when I put these in there. <laughs> Fitting the power supply in is always kind of awkward because you're trying to line up these um, like back four screws here and not break anything. Yeah, not break anything. So it goes right in there. Yep, that's what's going to keep it away from the motherboard when you're installing it. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> this is entertainment here. <laughs> I don't even know if I should help because this isn't like an extremely technical thing. 
Are you sure these screws go here? Yes! <laughs> it came with the power supply. All right, it's in. Please don't drop any more screws. Ouch. <laughs> you really get the $30 experience. This is the worst. <laughs> Did you really cut yourself? Yeah. Goodness. So this is a thing when you buy a cheap case, you tend to get unfinished metals. They don't tend to um, file down the edges. Stuff is easily bent or um, you know, they leave the sharp edges on and that can, <laughs> It's definitely not good for someone putting stuff together and just generally watch out and don't force anything. Uh, it's so easy to you know, get wrapped up and be like, I gotta fetch the screw or I gotta move this part to a certain place and uh, you cut your finger. You're welcome. You Is that it for the power supply? All right. Is that it? <laughs> well, you have to arrange the spaghetti octopus monster in such a way that everything turns right. on. Right. Okay. Can Any questions? <laughs> you start off with your motherboard power connector. I find this to be the most nerve wracking. So couple it together and then put it down. Can I just put one at a time? And one's in and then... No. No what? Because that longer side, it clips and pushes down the short one. That's actually good. What do you mean actually good? The next step is not this. <laughs> <laughs> The next step is your CPU power. This provides a 12 volt line directly to the CPU. I'm sure I can figure out where this goes. Monkeys and typewriters. <laughs> there we go. This is fun. How's that, internet? I'm a pro. Yeah. So the next part is to connect our SATA power to our DVD drive. There you go. All right, and now if you're anything like me, you're kind of vomiting and cringe right now because of all the bad cable management. Yeah. We're gonna tidy that up real quick with some zip ties. So far we have plugged in from the power supply to the motherboard, yes. to the processor, and the back fan to the motherboard and the DVD drive to the, the power supply. Is there anything else we've gotten? We just gotta do the, the front yep. IO. What we have to do now is the front IO and one SATA cable. For the DVD drive. Yep, and then we are good. We are on to the software stage. Yes, which um, we are doing not today. Hopefully in doing this, you can see it as a little bit less intimidating when you, know, you think of building your own computer. It's not a big science project, it's just putting together stuff. It's pretty neat, <laughs> pretty simple. And you've been able to catch on and we've done this pretty smoothly, would yeah. you say? Yeah. Yeah. So finish plugging it in. It doesn't matter what SATA port you go for. They're all pretty much the same. Pretty much. All right, got that one. And then all these. Yep. Go up, up here. Uh-huh. Um, this one, you read it says HD audio. And then there's also AC97. Just go for HD audio. It's over there in the corner. The white one that you can't reach because you zip tied it. <laughs> <laughs> HD audio, which is what you're hearing right now, provided by the Rhodes external microphone. Buy one today. USB. Okay, just anywhere. Yep, this motherboard has three USB headers. A header is just a bunch of pins sticking out and accepts a USB thing. Beautiful. All right, and the last step of this is the front panel connectors. These are a bunch of this. small small connectors that connect a reset switch, a power light, a hard drive light, generally letting you know that the computer is on. Oh boy, we got a whoopsies. Oh my gosh, why would they do that? They basically made a thing that looks like USB 2.0, or yeah, 2.0, and just put it there. No. Okay, so what I'm doing is moving this over. And then you can connect the IO to this. There's a little key that you can read and connect stuff with. Good luck. <laughs> what? This is probably my least favorite part of building a computer. 
because I have big fat sausage hands. <laughs> I cannot do it. Boom, baby. All right, two, three more to go. Keep it up. H D D L E D. Yes. P E L E. That's pled. Ah, there's two of them though. Yep. Okay. All right, last one. Uh, we're just power. Power. Yep. So yes. Well, that was rough, but we did it. <laughs> Everything is connected. Um, that's generally the internal right. assemblage of so a computer. In theory, plug in the power supply, turn it on, and it works. Yes. Let's right. do it. Let's do it. So let's see the moment of truth. If all of our hard work paid off, any final words? It works or it doesn't. All right. Let's do this. Let's do it. Let's do it together. Just, no, just do it. We got to do it together. No. Three, two, one. Oh, oh you I beat me. It. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, there's Wait, a little green on. dot. Oh, it's on. Woo! Go over here. Do we get the splash screen? Is this for anything? Uh, yeah. Yeah, hey, there we go. It works. <laughs> so there what, we it wants, go. what it wants now is just to install an operating system and it's good to go. So we got everything installed and it's working. The next logical step is to install an operating system. So you could do Windows or you could do Linux or some something like that. You could do a hypervisor running multiples at once. You could do a Hackintosh put on Mac OS, yeah. Yeah, whatever you want. So that is what we're going to be talking about next. So stay tuned. Like and subscribe. What's up, guys? <laughs> Hi there. And welcome to the next part of our basically build a computer for a developer and um, just the process along the way, do's and don'ts. What we're going to do now is install our operating system. What do we have today? So we have Windows 10 on a USB stick. And we have a bunch of other junk, but all we really did was get a monitor, keyboard, and mouse. All right. We will be showing how to get this at the end, but we figured we'd show the end result first, just for a little bit of excitement rather than six minutes of installing on a USB stick. So <laughs> Yeah. So for this system, would you be able to install other stuff as well, like Linux or maybe um, a hypervisor or maybe even a Hackintosh? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I don't know anything about hypervisoring. Um, you can install Linux, possibly a Hackintosh, but I don't know anything about that either. I'm imagining there's some pretty strict requirements. I don't know. <laughs> okay. What do you think? Um, yeah, if you're looking into making a Hackintosh, look at like specific parts you need to get because not everything's compatible. Um, your new Hackintosh might not like your new RTX card and uh, so forth. Yeah, so we're just installing Windows. This is one of those terrible videos where instead of recording the screen, you record the actual screen. So we changed perspectives and obviously when we turn the computer on, it's yelling at us because we did not put in our boot media, AKA the USB drive. Actually, if you get to this point, it means a lot of stuff is going right. It means all the hardware's in and things are good. So if you turn it on, it'll go through the boot and... Voila. Voila. Windows, a la virus. <laughs> then we just go through the setup process. We're gonna select English. <laughs> you can try to. And then we install. Uh, if you have an existing installation, it might be like, hey, do you want to upgrade? You can say custom install. Uh, you don't have to put in a product key at installation time. Yeah, so you can go in later and add the, the key. Uh, here you want to sign away your life and no one's ever read it actually. Hey, I read that. It's pretty good. <laughs> so this is what I was talking about. Upgrade, custom install, go to custom install, and it's just one drive. And that's our terabyte drive. Next. And then the waiting game. How would you do a dual boot? Yeah. You would use something to manage your partitions. There's lots of free utilities for that. Um, something I can think of is um, 
like there's the disk management console within Windows, so maybe you can slave the drive to another computer and move stuff around. There's lots of options, but the principle of it is cut your hard drive in half and install one and then install the other. And what you'll have is a bootloader, which is going to control uh, whether to boot into Windows or to boot into Linux. Um, the bootloader can be seen as kind of the first program that decides what operating system you have. In Mac, uh, if, you're, if you're doing like a Hackintosh, you, you might be familiar with Boot Camp. That's what allows people to have a Windows and a Mac installation on the same drive. All right, it's gonna restart. It's getting ready. Yeah. So if you wanted to install a version of Linux on here instead of Windows, you would just put it on a USB stick just like you would with Windows and it'd work exactly the same way? Yep, it'll be a, some Linux distros actually give you like a live testing stage and then you're, at, you're in the operating system to later install it onto the hard drive of it. So it's a similar process. Uh, Linux has made it very easy because people just tend to get used to swapping in and out of Linux distros. Well, here it's starting up for the very first time. When Windows starts up for the first time, it has to collect a lot of drivers to work and deal with your software. And another thing you gotta do with Windows 10 is create all the user account stuff. So I'm just gonna flip through this. I mean, it's a basic fill out the form, give it your email address. Uh, if you don't want a live account, uh, what you'll do is unplug the ethernet, take it offline, uh, it'll error out and allow you to create a local account. <laughs> That's just kind of a, a bug for me. <laughs> All right, well, let's... Uh, okay. But wait, there's more. There's more? <laughs> yes, there's more. So what we're gonna do now is connect the uh, ethernet and we're going to install a bunch of programs at once. I have a fancy utility program. Uh, it's called Ninite, N-I-N-I-T-E dot com. Go there to install a bunch of apps at once. So the very first thing I do whenever I install Windows is go straight to ninite.com and that's gonna give me a list of software that I can't get to because internet's not working. All right, here's Ninite. Um, Chrome, Opera, Firefox, um, Image like Firm. LibreOffice. <clears throat> What's that? Uh, it's just a word processing. Email client, VLC, .NET, Silverlight. Um, I have some image Definitely editors. Definitely need uh, paint.net. Yeah. <laughs> so there's actually a whole special thing over developer tools. So you can install Python, Notepad++. I think you've worked with FileZilla before. There's Putty, Eclipse, and Visual Studio Code. Uh, Pretty sweet. So for this purpose, I'm just going to install all of these. Um, I know we'll get to using them sooner or later on your channel. And uh, yeah, we're good to go. It'll send a program, save, run. So if you want to get Windows 10 on a USB stick, you can get the official Windows 10 ISO from the Microsoft website. Download that and is that good? That's gonna come with a tool, Windows 10 installation media, and it'll look something like this. From here, you can choose to upgrade this PC, which we're not gonna do that, obviously. So you'd click Create Installation Media and follow the prompt. Yes. And then choose USB flash drive, or if you want an ISO file, if you want to virtualize it. Or you could burn it to a DVD, very old school, but st some people still do it. Yeah. So USB flash drive, and next, and then you go from there. What it what it does is download it, verifies it, and throws away all the extra stuff. So I think you guys pretty much get the point. You can see we downloaded all these applications in just a couple of minutes, and we're currently downloading Windows 10. I guess we don't really need that, but if you guys want to follow along, that's what you would do. But that's pretty much all I have to say. Any final words? Building a computer is a great learning experience if you're a developer you can really start to understand the hardware that your software is running on and better understand the challenges that writing uh, special software and like using different techniques is gonna be beneficial and um, really just start to make connections.
So thank you guys for watching. Again, check out his channel if you want more computer building stuff and technician stuff. And let us know in the comments section what other kinds of videos or series you'd like to see from us. Sound good? Yep. All right. Thank you, everybody. Peace out. Like and, and subscribe. Yeah.